So the time of time of the Buddha, and the, there are a number of monks who were well known for their abilities to teach, to transmit the Buddha's teachings. And if you read the, the suttas, which is the collection of discourses in the Tipitaka, you'll find that they are not all attributed to the Buddha himself. There are a number of discourses um, that were given by Venerable Sariputta, the disciple foremost in wisdom. There are suttas, discourses delivered by Ramaha Moggallana, who was the um, the other chief disciple, and foremost in psychic powers, uh, but also a number from other enlightened disciples, including <coughs> one brilliant and very profound uh, discourse in the Majjhima delivered by uh, Kemiya, one of the great Arahant nuns or bhikkhunis in the Buddha's time. <coughs> And the monks who were, of all the monks who were praised by the Buddha and given this um, title of foremost in different areas of monastic life and spiritual development, <clears throat> was one monk who was foremost in um, summarizing the teachings of the Buddha. And another one was foremost in being able to expand at length upon short, pithy teachings of the Buddha. So this um, ability to listen well and to be able to expand upon um, abbreviated points and to summarize um, points made at length is uh, skills that were recognized by Buddha himself and things that we still um, <clears throat> develop to this day. So anyway, um, these are brief points that I will expand upon. Um, <clears throat> I keep practicing based on my understanding about sati and meditation. Is there any technique or guideline that I could check with myself whether I'm heading in the right direction? <clears throat> um, yes, there are a number of, of uh, guidelines and observations that you can make. <coughs> One of the first um, is that as uh, before we start practicing, I think we can acknowledge, we can accept that um, <clears throat> the things that make us suffer, upset us in life, far exceed the things that make us happy. And that when we do uh, experience some happiness in life, uh, it's very difficult to sustain it. It's very fragile and very easily undermined. <clears throat> so, um, in the words of one uh, the great modern teacher, is saying um, the normal um, mental life, the more of of people, is one in which uh, we find it very easy to suffer and rather difficult to be happy. <clears throat> or the things that make us suffer um, far exceed the things that give us pleasure and happiness. <clears throat> so one of the guidelines for in Buddhist practice is that you should observe that things that make you suffer decrease, have decreased, and the things that make you happy have increased. So that that's one thing uh, to look at. So... Yeah, for instance, you might you might have some uh, kind of encounter, painful encounter with somebody who uh, speaks <clears throat> um, coarsely or accuses you of something you haven't done, and so on. And you might think, "Oh, 
a year ago or three years ago, if that had happened, I would have been in complete, I would have fallen to pieces. I would have been, you know, a mess for days. And now, yeah, I feel it, but not so badly, you know, in just a few hours and I feel almost back to normal again. So this, this kind of observation that things that used to hurt us a lot, um, it's not that they don't hurt us anymore, um, but it doesn't go so deep. And we have the resources um, to be able to deal with these kinds of um, unwanted, unpleasant experiences. And then as our mind becomes clearer, um, it's like, you know, if you had a, um, say the front mirror, excuse me, the windscreen of your car was very dirty, and then one day you clean the windscreen and and uh, your your vision is... Um, is much clearer and stronger, and particularly you you become sensitive to goodness in a way that you didn't before. I think that most of us in the world today we we're kind of sensitive to um, selfishness and and ugliness and um, evil of various kinds, and we feel um, oppressed by it or depressed by it. Um, we can think that's the way the world is, that's the way people are. <clears throat> and some people say, oh, you should just try and be positive, look on the bright side of life, but it feels kind of artificial and it doesn't really stand up um, very well to experience. But when we start to look more clearly at our life and the experiences, the people around us, um, we see, we sense so much more goodness and kindness than we ever we ever thought before, and we find in ourselves that things that uh, formerly you would, couldn't believe that we could enjoy things that would give us pleasure, you know, like getting up early in the morning, or meditating, or chanting, or um, even mindful activities like sweeping and cleaning. Um, when we bring the right uh, quality of mind to them, uh, we can find uh, re unexpected um, pleasure and joy in all kinds of activities. <clears throat> so as a, as a general um, observation, I would say if you're practicing well, things that make you unhappy should be decreasing and things that make you happy should be increasing. Um, now, part of this increased focus and sensitivity to what's going on in, in the real world of your body and mind rather than in your fantasies and desires and fears and anxieties, but what's really, are really going on, um, what you're looking at essentially is causality, seeing the way things um, affect each other, the way you're physical health, your physical um, state of your body affects your mental states, the way your mental states affect your, your body, the way your actions and speech affect your mind, the way your mind affects your actions and speech. So you're gaining all this data, like raw data about what's really going on in your life. <clears throat> and from that, um, a really strong, much stronger faith in the law of kamma and, and causality, as the Buddha taught it, arises through that observation. <clears throat> so, you know, if we um, speak harshly or unkindly or, or do something uh, which hurts, unnecessarily hurts other people, um, if we're, before we started meditating, then tendency is to try and interpret it, spin it in such a way that you come out okay and it was really uh, <clears throat> not too blameworthy or else you try to um, suppress the, um, the memory or the shame or the guilt you feel by um, alcohol or drugs or some kind of enjoyment, um, some kind of activity. <clears throat> And you and you really fail to see the cause and effect. And um, but when you start looking more closely in my mindfulness, 
you see, yeah, when I act like this, these are the consequences. It's not worth it. Um, and when I act like this, I just feel so bad afterwards. It, I feel ashamed. Um, um, it's something not to do, not to follow. So uh, what we call hiri o tapa, um, this wise understanding of consequences of actions, <coughs> and this, um, this, this sense of shame, which is not guilt, but it's... Um, it's um, a shame about action rather than about yourself and who you are. <coughs> this should be coming more and more strong and apparent. Uh, as a consequence of this, you should find that um, keeping precepts um, just comes to seem common sense, um, seems so obvious that um, if you really um, wish for your life to be uh, free of suffering and to um, progress in Dhamma, um, then um, these, these five precepts are non-negotiable. And not because, you know, the Buddha says you should keep five precepts or something like that, but you really understand um, how the role they play in practice um, and in leading a, a good and um, productive life. One other thing is just basically that ability to stay stay with the practice. I mean, the biggest, the only real failure in in practice is stopping. Um, all the other failures and mistakes and wrong turns that you take, they're all um, you know, they can all be remedied. Um, the only thing that uh, can't be remedied is giving up altogether. So that that kind of patience and commitment, um, and most importantly, enjoyment, appreciation of of dhamma practice. Um, these are are the signs that um, some progress is being made.